Hey guys, we got a really fun build show for you today. We're doing something a little different. We're in the studio today and we're going to be reviewing some past footage and photos that I've taken on Swiss job sites, specifically reviewing three different projects and the materials and the methods they use to build in Switzerland. The first one, a very old house, 500 year old house that's getting remodeled and brought up to modern code standards. Next, a quote unquote standard construction house in Switzerland for a uh, you know normal Swiss family. And lastly, we're going to review a multifamily building being built with CLT, that's cross laminated timbers. We've got a lot of interesting things to talk about, and I think quite a few takeaways for my North American builder friends. Today's build show all about Switzerland. Let's get going. Okay, guys, so here's the deal. I went to Switzerland three years ago and took a tour of a bunch of projects under construction. We made several good videos there. But since then, I've had the time to kind of digest that. I've also made friends with some uh, Swiss builders. Uh, big thanks to my friend Toby at Siga, uh, who's based out of Luzerne, and, and provided some of the photos that I've got today. And I actually took a trip to Switzerland in January. Now, my job site tours got a little cut short. We had a uh, quite a few people in our party that got COVID. <laughs> so the job site tours got shut down. So instead, I'm going to show you some photos and videos and we're going to get into it. So first off, uh, Switzerland is everything you, you might think it or dream it of. Absolutely beautiful. I visited with uh, my wife and another builder friend of mine, Luke and Melissa Mesger. And this is us walking at the base of Mount Titlis. Uh, but we spent most of our time in Luzerne, which is a big and iconic and beautiful city. And right when you arrive at the train station in Luzerne, this is what greets you. This is a wooden bridge from like the 1400s. Very, very old and absolutely beautiful. Uh, I'm proud of that photo that I got. And my buddy taught me how to edit it in RAW. Uh, thank you, Matthew. But I think this kind of sets you up for what you're going to see in the rest of Switzerland. Very, very proud of their construction. Uh, a lot of wood construction, unlike other parts of Europe that I saw a lot of, or South America, where you see a lot of block construction or uh, cinder block. Or uh, uh, I see when I traveled through Germany, I saw a lot of uh, other types of block materials, even besides cinder block. But we had an amazing time touring around downtown, let alone the job sites. Before I get to the jobs, though, I went to a tourist shop and we saw some cuckoo clocks that reminded me, wish I had a photo of it. I had a cuckoo clock, just like the one that's a little left of my wife right there when I was a kid growing up. And that iconic cuckoo clock building, funny enough, you kind of see that same shape around the countryside. This is a house that's right outside the uh, Sega headquarters uh, where we travel through right outside of Luzerne. And boy, does it, you'd think a cuckoo would just come right out of one of those windows. Very iconic Swiss construction, chalet, big overhangs, usually very, very durable materials on the roof, uh, you know, clay tile in particular, I saw a lot of. Also interesting, multi-story house. This looked to be like a single family, but each individual story had an awning over the windows, so they really did a good job protecting that. And interesting enough, wood siding. As we traveled around the mountains, absolutely beautiful. And that wood kind of siding with clay tile roof, that's a pretty typical detail. And that leads us to our very first house that I want to review. We're going to start with the old and then we'll come back to the new. So first off, this house uh, was a project, and I'm not even going to pronounce it, but that's what it's called, uh, in this kind of southern portion. Uh, as you know, Switzerland, not a very big company uh, country, but a lot of elevation change. Kind of reminds me a lot of the Rocky Mountains. Um, with massive highs and lows. The lowlands don't get a whole lot of precipitation. From what I read on the internet, they get like 20 some inches a year in, in the kind of low elevations. In the high elevations in the Alps, they get the equivalent of 70 inches of precipitation a year. So massive snowfall. And temperatures from what I saw reading online, uh, about 80s, uh, 85 maybe is a summertime absolute high, Fahrenheit that is. Uh, and of course the lows can be pretty darn low. So it did really remind me of Canadian, uh, you know, maybe Northern Canada type weather, maybe Minnesota, certainly the Rocky mountains, uh, in terms of, uh, what North America might be like. So this building that we're going to talk about first 
about 500 years old, built in the 16th century, originally a residence for priests. I don't want to go into all the uh, specifics here. Feel free to pause the video anytime I'm going too fast to read it. But here's what the wall section look like. You saw earlier wood construction, solid wood. I mean, this honestly reminds me a lot of log houses in America that, uh, you know, early frontier builders were building in America. Solid wood. And so they couldn't mess with the outside facade, obviously, historic building, and they wanted to look beautiful. But they could retrofit and upgrade the inside. So how do they do that? They used wood fiber insulation. Uh, I saw this a lot in Europe, and I, it's kind of surprised me. I'd never seen this in America before. Here's two particular brands of this. Kind of cushy and springy, like you might expect, but a little harder than maybe a fiberglass or a uh, mineral wool insulation. And then some type of framing on the inside to receive that. And then they're really big on air tightness layers on the inside. Now, full disclosure, Sega is not sponsoring this video, but they did pay for my trip over there when I went. And uh, of course they showed me projects with their products, but it seems like Sega, which is actually made in Switzerland, amazing adoption in Switzerland. And what you're seeing here, this uh, Myrex, I think is how you pronounce it. It looks like Majrest or Majory uh, for the American pronunciation. <laughs> this is a airtight vapor permeable layer on the inside of the house. Really no difference than you would use in those upper climate zones in America and Canada, where we don't want air to get into the wall cavities, but we do want vapor to be able to dry to the inside or to the outside. And I suspect that uh, that's another reason why they like this type of insulation because uh, number one, it could be made locally, but also because it could dry both directions. So this is pretty typical. This happens to be the architect in the project. I have no idea how to pronounce that, so I'm not going to uh, embarrass myself. But that was pretty much the strategy for this house, uh, was to do some light framing on the inside, leave the wood exposed. I love this picture that Toby gave me because it showed the, uh, the carpenter's tools and that wooden toolbox. Uh, I understand that carpenters in their apprentice program actually make their toolbox as part of their carpentry program. Uh, Patrick, one of my German buddies who's a carpenter here, has a toolbox similar that he made when he was an apprentice carpenter in Germany. I love the pride in the organization of that shot too and how they kind of put everything back in its place. I suspect this is a uh, morning shot before the work gets going that day. Also interesting to see that they're running all of their services, you know, their electrical conduit, potentially plumbing, anything inboard of the insulation, inboard of the air tightness layer. Uh, I didn't put a slide here, but I can add this later. That's how I have been doing uh, a house currently with my friends at Bensonwood. This is an American timber frame builder uh, that I'm doing a project with right now, and I've done a project with before, where they do an air tightness layer on the inside. Then we do a service framing cavity, and then we run all the services inboard of that. And it's a really interesting way to build uh, because now you don't have all these penetrations trying to detail a layer like we might in America where we're using, let's say, drywall as an airtight layer. And we're trying to caulk and seal and do everything around that drywall when that's not particularly easy. Uh, and here it is. It looks like they're all ready to go for sheetrock. So that's pretty much wanted to show, what I wanted to show you about this project. It was kind of interesting that they sent some pictures of the building science folks looking for air leaks, using a FLIR camera to kind of see how it was going so they could actually test it and make sure it was going to perform. But let's switch gears now and let me show you a house that I actually visited in person last time. And I'm going to show you a couple uh, videos, uh, just a couple clips of this. And then I'm going to talk about what I've since kind of learned and thought of since I saw this. But this is actually from, as you can see here, from 2019 uh, when I visited there, so three years ago. And this first clip is a single-family house that's getting a remodel addition project added on. So let's take a look at this. Ooh, yeah. All right, so we're here in Switzerland, and we're at a job site with these guys, Smith and Rusli. They're doing an addition on this 1980s house. And so we're gonna walk you through the job site. And I'm gonna speed myself up since Matt tended to be a little bit uh, 
slow in his uh, in his progression to the back of the house. But here we are in the scaffolding on the back of the house where they've added a second story addition. And now we can start to see framing insulation and some and some interesting details. So let's see what let's see what Matt has to say. From the get-go, it's really interesting. Now I took a little tour with my Sega tour guide and I got to talk to the builder earlier. So I've kind of pre planned or gotten the, the tour here. But I'll tell you, this is some interesting construction. So first off, framing, not all that different than what we do in America. You know, they've got, I don't know what these are. It looks like a laminated two by four, where it's actually more like a three by four, something like that. And then we've got some bat insulation in between the studs. But first off, you notice on the outside, no sheathing on the outside. The sheathing is actually on the inside of the house, pretty wild. And I do want to mention that plastic you're seeing in the foreground, that's not a water resistive barrier. That's literally just plastic they tacked up to keep drips from splashing back onto the framing or onto those rock wool uh, mineral wool bats. But let's keep going on the video. Let's see what else I have to say about this. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt myself there. Then they've got some rock wool bats in between there, a couple of big old posts. And you're, of course, thinking, gosh, there's a lot of thermal bridging here. Isn't it cold? Well, guess what? They've got some massive insulation that they're putting on the outside of the house. Okay, so here's this giant Lego block insulation. Look at this. It's like, I don't know, four or five inches thick. You can see it's a tongue and groove, and then it's pre-plastered on the outside. And this is an insulation that I just heard of recently, but I had never seen in person. This is a wood fiber insulation made in Germany. I'm not sure of the R value, but this is a continuous blanket on the whole outside of the building. They staple it on with this absolutely giant staple that's going all the way through back into the framing, and then they're going to plaster over the whole outside of this. So it's, it's going to uh, basically, basically be a plaster or a, a stucco finish on the outside. But check out the interesting details on the windows. There's this giant pocket right here. And that's because they do drop down blinds here in Switzerland. So this low voltage wire here is going to power a motor that will drop some blinds down on the outside. Right, let me pause for a second here. This is early on in my trip to Switzerland and I, I traveled through Germany shortly after that on the same trip. And I wasn't used to seeing it, but after now having been back, I realized it's really, really common throughout Europe to have exterior shades. And it's pretty interesting and beneficial for several reasons. An exterior shade prevents the sun from going through the glass to begin with. So we're not worried about low E coatings, for instance, uh, blocking that heat transfer uh, at the glass. Instead, you could drop your shade down. And almost all the shades that I saw there had two layers. They had a kind of privacy shade that still let light through. And then they might have had a blackout shade as well. So pretty interesting that's all mounted outside. Also because the windows are uh, tilt turn windows. So they actually come into the house rather than outside of the house. And they, they kind of tilt in for ventilation. So those exterior shades, pretty interesting and, and really, really common throughout uh, all of my travels uh, of Europe. Uh, let me walk over this way too. Let me show you this. So here's the blinds pocket they've made already, and they put a thinner insulation on the outside of the pocket. The blinds will be in here, and then you can see they pre-lined the outside of the window with another thick blanket of that insulation, and then they'll have that will come over the top, that big, thick, five-inch one. Pretty cool. And then as you look at the roof line, check this out. This is going to be a little hard to see. Let's see if I can show you. But on this roof, you can see this roof's about 18 inches deep or so. And from here all the way up, that's like, I don't know, 16 inches or so of that fiberboard insulation on this low pitched uh, roof. It looks like maybe a one in 12 pitch, real, almost a flat roof. And then there's a stainless steel metal siding slash roofing up there. All right, let's pause again here. Let's talk for a second about this exterior insulation that I saw throughout Switzerland, which I don't see much in America. I think that the American equivalent of this uh, might be Rockwell. Um, Rockwell makes a rigid exterior insulation, which which has a lot of similar properties. But when I saw this on the on that building, I actually got these samples from the Bau Show when I visited the German uh, version of the IBS three years ago. 
there's really only a couple manufacturers of this. It's a wood fiber material that has a pretty high compressive strength. It almost feels like, I don't know, uh, Ikea furniture that's blown up a little bit. <laughs> but what's interesting about it is it's more water resistant than I expected. In fact, I did a little kitchen test with a sample of this Gutex, which happens to be R3.4 per inch, because I was curious how much water it, was, it would absorb. So let's actually cut to my kitchen real quick at the office, and let me show you what happened with this. Little office test of this Gutex. This is a wood fiberboard insulation with a highly compressibility strength, or strength against compression, I should say. Uh, pretty high R value per inch, and this is wood fiber. It says that it can be used as a WRB behind a ventilated rain screen. I'm just curious whether it would absorb water. So it is 1045 and we're gonna put this into some water and see how she does. Okay, so I filled up a little Tupperware to about two inches or so. And I'm gonna put this in and we'll see how it, oh, that's interesting, it floats. So it is kind of, uh, moisture resistant slash hydrophobic. That's interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a weight on this and hold it down and we'll see what happens. Okay y'all it's been a hair over three hours and my little kitchen test has been rolling. That's interesting. It still wants to float so it's not it's not like a kitchen sponge. It looks like maybe we've can't tell is it soaked up any water it doesn't feel like it's soaked up any water maybe though maybe i'm getting a drip or two out of it that could just be water that's dripping off the bottom so interesting i can see if this is in a, a ventilated rain screen that if it got wet it would kind of run off and dry i'd be a little more inclined to use rock wool which uh, i know doesn't have any organics in it like this but a little backyard test, I'd, I'd say it did better than I expected. It, it didn't soak up like a sponge. Cool. Okay, so after three hours in a tub of water, it did look like some water was actually absorbed in some way, shape, or form. But it wasn't the sponge that I expected it to be. So if there was a rain screen, meaning a wood batten, and then a siding on this that would shed most of the water... I could see it, but honestly, when I first visited this job site, I thought that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen, seeing a wood <laughs> exterior insulation on a house. And I sure as heck wouldn't use this in a fire-prone area or, a, you know, an area that had termites necessarily. But I can see why they do it in Switzerland. I suspect there's no termite issues there. And I also suspect because of their cold weather that it's pretty dry uh, moisture-wise in the air a lot of the, a lot of the time. So anyways, with that being said, let's, now that you kind of get a gauge on the, on the outside, which is kind of like the inside for us, uh, open stud bays, rock wool bats, and then rigid insulation. Let's fast forward in the video to minute seven and let's go in inside and let's see what they do on the inside now. So here's the inside of the house. The, a bunch of the finished woods in the house is that three ply plywood too. I'll show you a scrap of it in a minute. And then again, we come down onto the OSB, everything's taped, and then they're going to hang that blue board material. And then the last thing I want you to... Okay, so I'll pause here. On the inside is where they put their structural sheathing. There's a basically an OSB, seems pretty darn similar to what we'd use in the U.S. And then on the ceiling, on top of those rafters, they've got another one of those SEGA membranes. And then they tape the heck out of everything, so that's their air tightness layer. And then they're running all of their electrical inboard of all that. So in other words, on this exterior wall, I didn't see any plugs or outlets. Uh, it looked like they were doing floor outlets and maybe some work on the ceiling, but that was about it. Uh, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you here. Let's fast forward to another really cool thing that I saw on the inside of this house, which is a tool that I've never seen in American construction. I'm forwarding over to 1303, and here we go. Package at this house here in Switzerland. Okay, y'all, last thing before we leave this Swiss job site, check this tool out. This is not a tool that I've ever seen in America. When you are fastening this super thick insulation, 
this, I don't know what it is, four or five inch. How do you do it? You use a massive staple. So look at that staple right there. This staple is going all the way through that insulation and getting some bite on the framing. And check out this gun. <laughs> you gotta lift weights just to hold this. I, I don't know what this thing weighs, but it's gotta be 20 pounds. That is a beast. And look, it can actually shoot longer staples than this. Looks like this could shoot maybe up to a five, five and a half, six inch staple. Man, that's a cool gun. Isn't that wild? So that's really pretty typical from what I've seen in Swiss residential construction was a lot of wood, a lot of what I would consider kind of normal American uh, construction materials, minus maybe some, some weirdo insulation choices. But other than that, they do everything similarly except maybe inside out. That's pretty wild. Uh, some interesting takeaways there. Let's keep going. And let's go back to actually my PowerPoint. And I want to show you that commercial job that I promised you. Uh, let me cue this up because there's also some interesting parallels here in the commercial job. So, again, I'm not real sure how to pronounce this, but interesting now in this commercial job, we don't have the giant uh, overhangs. We don't have that kind of classic Swiss chalet style. It seems like they really have a bent towards modern in, uh, in some of their new construction, especially multifamily. Not too different, really, from uh, North America. This project, slightly different climate, lower elevation. Uh, this is kind of north uh, Switzerland. And what's interesting about this one is that uh, this particular project was really intent on using materials from the area. And this, from what I can tell, is very common in Switzerland. The Swiss love wood, and every Swiss builder I talked to uh, was using wood from Switzerland. I don't think they're exporting from other European nations. They're actually literally, even though this country is very small, they're growing their own forests, cutting them down, using their own wood. And this CLT job was advertising to the world that not only was this wood Swiss wood, but it was like local to the region where they're actually building the house. And this project in particular uh, is one that was a little more uh, typical, I guess, in, uh, in terms of Swiss construction, in that the walls were solid wood walls. <laughs> That's right, no interior insulation. Maybe they were going to add exterior insulation. I don't know because all I've seen is these photos. But check out that panel flying in. This is panelized CLT, cross-laminated timber. So this is a timber section that's built in a factory. It's from multiple plies of smaller trees. That's not like, uh, you know, six-by-sixes that are put together. This is probably one-inch plies of wood that are laminated together. And that's going to make up a floor cavity and a wall section from this solid timber. Now, remember, wood has an R value. Softwoods, if you kind of look at the Internet, say that soft softwoods are around R1.4 per inch. Hardwoods have less R value at maybe 0.7 per inch. But this wall here that I'm seeing on the outside looks to be maybe an 8-inch or 10-inch thick wood wall. No insulation that I can tell going in. Uh, inside and I'm not even sure if there's any outside insulation on this project so as a result you've got a continuous maybe R10 on the building uh, 12 R12 something like that and if they put some good triple glazed windows in that are R5 or 6 that's honestly a pretty good wall assembly considering there's no thermal bridging because the whole thing is solid wood also interesting to see that they're building a temporary roof over top of the construction project. I think that's uh, a bit of a more standard thing in CLT construction where you're making sure that building's not gonna get soaking wet. You're gonna build a temporary roof. I thought that was pretty cool. What a, what a neat photo too. And then all these panels were actually brought to the job site pre-made. Now they've got a, a guy in the job site who's taping up the, uh, the SEGA membranes to keep them airtight. But here's a factory shot where they're doing the exterior weather-resistant barrier, also a SEGA product called MyCoat. And they've got a uh, craftsman and a craftswoman at the job site. And this is the builder who's building these panels, doing all this work on the flat in the factory, and then shipping it to the job site. 
that was pretty darn interesting. Let's uh, let's close out today's video with uh, with two things that I want to direct you towards for if you're interested in learning a little bit more or seeing a little bit more. There's two videos that I made uh, in Switzerland that I'm just going to give you a brief preview, and I'll put a link in the description on these. This one's called uh, Wood on Wood on Wood. Uh, you know, a builder that that also had no insulation on their projects, and uh, and this video is fascinating because they also don't have any fasteners that aren't wood as well. They're literally using wood nails and wood dowels to build these panels. And I suspect that CLT project might have something similar. So I'll put a link to this house or this uh, uh, factory, I should say, that I visited. And then the last thing I want to uh, show you is, uh, let's see, where is it? Right here. This video, this building is probably one of the most beautiful buildings I've ever been in my short. Get the crowd uh, moving during live sound. Year career. Uh oh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't fast forward through the uh, commercial. Sorry, y'all. Don't forget to click on the ads while you're watching my videos. By the way. <laughs> so what you're seeing behind me. I'm not sure if is the sound not working here. Hold spell. There we go. That's what I said. And check this out. All right. That was my buddy Toby, by the way, who helped me out. But. This is the offices of the panelized maker that they're building right next to their factory. And what you're just seeing is the big square box on the outside. But when you go inside this building, this is literally one of the most beautiful, incredible offices. I'm hoping that I'll get to go back in the future and visit these guys. That's the architect uh, who designed and the, look at uh, these finished the walls. This inside but wall it's a wood here. building a with all wood finishes, a concrete core sure that has an a elevator, sure a and it. even a wood floor look, system that is mostly solid wood. You see the holes that are in there? They're going to run their uh, Upanor PEX piping through there. They're going to fill it with sand, and then they're going to put a hardwood floor on top of that. And that's going to totally deaden the noise. It's going to make that whole floor assembly uh, heat up and radiate both high and low. And then what you're seeing above me is the finished roof panel and the walls are the finished walls. Absolutely gorgeous. You guys need to check out this video. Anyways, I think the big takeaways for Americans uh, are, uh, are maybe three things here. Number one, the Swiss are huge on air tightness. And big thanks to Sega for, uh, for bringing me out here. They make some bomber products that really help with air tightness. And I think more and more American builders are going to adopt those methods, maybe even some of those Sega products as well, to help uh, make that airtight layer. Number two, they're really big on vapor open. I didn't see any vapor barriers, anything that was plastic or uh, spray foam polymers, anything like that in any of their projects under construction. Very much a local resource local pride, uh, and a very much pride of craftsmanship attitude that I absolutely loved. And I think American builders share that. And, you know, for me, for instance, I live in Texas. Most of the lumber that I use to frame my houses is actually grown in East Texas. So it's a short rail car ride from East Texas. Uh, a lot of the Huber woods that I use that are panelized products, like the zip sheathing that I use, for instance, and the Advantech, that's made in Oklahoma, which is just one state away. So it's really cool to see those parallels between American and Swiss builders. Uh, if you guys ever get the chance to travel over there, I highly recommend it. If for no other reason than to see buildings that are several hundred years old. You know, I started the uh, presentation out with that 500-year-old building and that wooden bridge that was like six or 700 years old. When you grow up with that mentality of such old buildings, I think it really instills in you a desire uh, to keep things going, to build things that last. And there's a certain value placed in your work as a craftsman and as a builder that maybe we sometimes miss in America when we think about moving every couple of years or what happens if I get uh, you know, transferred to a Chicago job and I have to leave this house? Will I pay back that, uh, that project, that material, whatever I'm using on that project? In Switzerland, that single family that I visited, the addition was happening because uh, mom and dad, who were, uh, you know, I suspect in their 50s or 60s, lived downstairs. Their son, who was newly married, was going to live upstairs in that new addition. And that's the kind of thing that happens in Switzerland. We've got more than one generation living under the same roof. They see those houses uh, as multi-generational houses. 
And also, frankly, part of that is because it's expensive. I mean, Switzerland is not a low cost of living uh, place. And most people in Switzerland do not own a single family home. So, uh, you know, when we are able to buy a property, we think about that property on a long term basis. Anyways, guys, hopefully you learned something here. Super fun project uh, for me to work on and kind of get think about how this uh, these visits that I've made translate to you as American builders. Stay tuned for my next episode. We actually got a chance to visit the Sega factory where a lot of those membranes and tapes were made. And they really kind of opened up the covers for me to see the process of making those. I also got to meet the owners of the company and the, and the second generation that's taking over leadership. Now this is a family owned Swiss company. Uh, so we've got some really fun video on the next time, but if you're not currently a subscriber, hit that subscribe button, guys. We've got new content here in the Build Show every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show.com.